All right, hello everybody. This is Noah here with Learn Meta Analysis. And in this video, we're gonna be talking about publication bias. Now, this is something that you really should be familiar with if you are conducting a meta analysis. And it's certainly something that you should try and understand if you are interpreting them. So by the end of this video, I would like you to be able to identify various publication bias tests that might be used for both conventional and three level meta analysis models. Now, I wanna preface this whole conversation by saying that publication bias is a relatively large area of research and I don't want you to go into this thinking that the statistics we're going to talk about are the end-all be-all answer. Rather, the way I like to think about publication bias is helping me better understand the sample of studies that I analyzed rather than being able to say yes or no publication bias is an issue. So with that in mind, we first have probably heard of the file drawer problem. And what this refers to is that studies with significant results may be more likely to be published than those without. And so as somebody conducting a meta-analysis, you may not be able to locate those studies that didn't have significant results because they may not show up in public places where you can actually access them. So what this means is that the published work may not actually be representative of the field. Instead, it might only be representative of the published studies, which may be more likely to have statistically significant results than those that weren't. So this sounds problematic, right? If you're trying to really understand a comprehensive evaluation of the field is what you really want to do. But instead, if you're only able to find studies or you're mostly able to only find studies with significant results, what happened to the rest of them? Well, they're in someone's file drawer, and this has been known as a problem in meta-analysis, or I should say at least a potential problem in meta-analysis for many, many, many years. So what can we do? Well, there's a number of approaches for conventional meta-analysis, and I'll mention that um, pretty much all of them that I know about have been critiqued. Um, perhaps there's some that, that haven't to the same extent as others. But with that said, um, I think they all help us at least better understand the nature of our sample, which is why I think it's particularly valuable. So one of the things that we can do is look at funnel plots. We can also use Eggers regression. We can use trim and fill analysis, and there's a number of fail-safe end tests that we can use. So the first one is a funnel plot, and it's called that because it looks like a funnel. And so you can see on one side we have standard error, and on the other side, we, in this case anyway, we have standardized mean difference, which was the effect size that was used in the meta-analysis. So what we can see here is essentially a funnel, and the black dots indicate individual effect sizes. And what we're doing when we're examining funnel plots is we're visually inspecting for asymmetry. If that sounds kind of vague, it's because it is. We all know what symmetry means, but what would constitute asymmetry? Or even a more loaded question, what would constitute significant asymmetry? When you're visually inspecting, that may be challenging to identify. So when we look at this, we can say it's relatively symmetrical. That's kind of vague, right? But that's the best we can go with with a visual inspection of the funnel plot. So because in part of this problem, um, there's also ways to statistically inspect for funnel plot asymmetry. So we can use Eggers regression. And over here on the right, we have some output from metaphor in R. And you can see that we get a p-value. And so that's what we're really looking for with this test. If it is statistically significant, so less than p equals 05, then we see significant evidence of funnel plot asymmetry. In this case, we don't have that. So we can say that the funnel plot is relatively symmetrical. Now, another analysis that I really like, I think it, I think it's kind of fun. Um, I shouldn't, I don't really have any other reason why I kind of like it other than I think it's, it's, it's a fun analysis, is the trim and fill analysis. And over here on the right, you can see I have two things highlighted in green in the output. One is the estimated number of studies that are missing, and second is the model results. So what this test is essentially doing is estimating how many studies may be missing. And in this case, you can see it's from the right side of the funnel because it tells us that on the right side and it tells us there's two. So that's pretty cool. But what's even more cool about this is we can then estimate the model if these two studies were imputed. So if these two studies were included, and you can see that's what's highlighted as the estimate down under the model results. That is, if these two studies were included, this is what the overall effect size would be. And so what we can do with this is we can actually compare this to our previous meta-analysis results and see how different they are or how similar they are. Now, another thing that I think is kind of fun about the trim and fill analysis is you can actually get a funnel plot for it. And over on the left, you can see our original standard funnel plot. And on the funnel plot on the right, you can see that there's two studies imputed, and I highlighted them in green. They have the green box around them. And you can tell these are the ones that are imputed because they are hollow in the center. They don't have the solid dot. So that is where the missing studies would be according to this analysis. And I just like this because 
I like the visual representation as well as the s statistical representation. I like the combination of both because it helped, I feel it helps me better understand my data. Now there's also a number of fail-safe end tests. Um, there's three major approaches I'm aware of, one by Rosenthal, run by Orwin, and one by Rosenberg. Uh, over here on the right, I gave you some sample output from Metaphor, um, which tells you the fail-safe N number. And all of these tests are essentially looking to tell us the number of studies with null results that would be needed to reduce our p-value to whatever chosen level we have. And so in this case, um, that would be 0.05. And so what we look at with this result using the Rosenthal approach, it says we would need 1,028 studies with null results to reduce our significance level to less than 0.05. So this is an interesting statistic. I see it reported. I've also seen it criticized. Um, so it's another one of those things that just helps us better understand our sample. So what about three-level meta-analysis? All of those tests are applicable to two-level models, but what happens when we look at a three-level model? Well, there was a paper that came out relatively recently about this, and they found that traditional approaches can have inflated type one error rates, which is obviously not great. Um, so the DOI is included here. Highly encourage you to read that paper. Uh, their findings showed that Eggers regression can work when using robust variance estimation or multi-level frameworks. And again, that paper covers this pretty well. Um, another approach that we can do is use funnel plots because we can still create funnel plots. So let's talk a little bit about the funnel plots specifically. So we're using an approach here that was defined in the paper listed there in the bottom right corner of the screen where you can see we have a DOI. But what I want you to see here is very obvious asymmetry in both plots, right? And I included this example specifically because it is asymmetrical as compared to the one we saw earlier, which was relatively symmetrical. So we have two different funnel plots here. The one on the left is by comparison, whereas the one on the right groups them by study. So remember in a three level model, we can have more than one comparison per study, which is why over on the right hand side, you can see that there are uh, little tick boxes that have either three or two next to the dot. And that is telling us how many comparisons were within that study. But you can see in both of these plots, it's quite asymmetrical. There's many more studies to the right side of the mean, which is the solid dark line, than there are to the left. All right, so what does this all mean? Essentially, no publication bias test is perfect, at least that I have ever heard of, and I don't think that we should trust them implicitly. So just because the result is significant doesn't mean that your whole analysis is gone. It really comes down to a matter of fact of we need to consider the context of this, right? So we can also examine plots and we can use many different statistics to help us understand the nature of our data. And that's why I really think of publication bias as really helping us build a deeper understanding of our data as much as it is reporting on quote unquote publication bias. That said, you should report publication bias results and tests with your analysis. It's a standard in the field. I don't expect it to go away anytime soon, but it really comes down to how you analyze it and how you interpret it, right? So if you interpret this as, oh, we found significant publication bias and therefore whole analysis is, is not great, that might be overextending what, what is being found. So some of the recommendations that I've seen in the literature are to consider how different the effect size is if you account for this publication bias. And that's one of the reasons why I actually like the trim and fill analysis for the conventional model, is because we can see from that how much the overall effect size would change if those studies were imputed. So let's say, for example, that there, we find a number of studies are missing, but it barely changes our overall effect size. Our, we, we can impute those studies and only changes our overall effect size by maybe like a hedges G value of 0.03 or something like that then that means that while publication bias might exist, it wasn't very, it doesn't seem like it would be very influential, right? So we really need to consider the context of publication bias, and that's why I feel it's more about understanding your data set and some of the context of your data set more than it is a yes, no question on the publication bias front. So hopefully this helped you better understand publication bias in the context of meta-analysis, as well as the context of two-level and three-level models. So with that said, thank you guys, and I'll see you in the next video.